Welcome to another episode of the Chris McGee Show. This is what I'm going to call it. Um, this is my second guest, Sam Rowe. Uh, Sam, thank you very much for coming on and joining me today. Thank you for having me. You're really very appreciate welcome. it. You're very welcome. And uh, you actually reached out to me on LinkedIn, which was great. And once I sort of browsed your profile, I thought this is going to be a great conversation. So why don't you tell us, uh, tell everybody who you are, what you're all about and uh, what you do exactly. Yeah, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Samantha Rowe or Samantha Nerea, whichever, whichever you prefer. Um, so I am the founder of High Q Coaching. What I do is I work with SMEs um, on their founders or their HR teams to help promote mental well-being within the organization. Um, and we, I do this to help improve productivity within the teams themselves. One of the things I focus in on particularly is imposter syndrome. And the reason that I focus in on that is because 70% um, of us actually in society experience imposter syndrome at some stage in our lives. And yet when we mention the word imposter syndrome, people often scratch their head and look at me and say, what's imposter syndrome? So we have, we have this thing that, that we all experience that has implications for all of us, and yet we don't understand enough about it. And by understanding what it is and its implications, we can unlock so much potential within ourselves um, and within our teams and our personal lives as well. So tell, let, let's talk about imposter syndrome for a second, because it's, <laughs> it's certainly a term that I've heard come up a lot of times. And it's something I wouldn't say I've suffered from, but there is certainly times when you're trying to reach the next level and you're trying to talk about it and you're trying to give advice. So you're trying to put something on social media and you're afraid to do it because you're sitting saying, am I at that level? Can I actually give that advice? Can I, can I say that? Am I there? So what, what sort of uh, problems do you see with imposter syndrome and clients that you work with? Yeah. So imposter syndrome rears its head quite frequently. Um, and a lot of the people I um, work with tend to be quite high achievers. And one of the things with imposter imposter syndrome there's several different types so you'll have the expert you'll have the the procrastinator you'll have the um the perfectionist you'll have the natural genius there's so many different types and each type ha has its own implications the issues with imposter syndrome can be far reaching now I think I was saying to you before we started there, Chris, within the diagnostic um, criteria for mental health, the ICD-10 or the DSM-5, imposter syndrome doesn't have its own um, area. Sometimes it's described as a symptom of anxiety. Oh, should I be here? Um, and that it's so much more than that. So imposter syndrome can be that feeling like I'm a phony and I'm going to get found out. I don't belong here and people are going to catch on that I don't belong here. It's that feeling of being fake, of being phony, you know, that, that I don't deserve this. Maybe sometimes you'll feel like you're undeserving. And those are feelings that we can all have at some point, but it's our reaction to those feelings that kind of determines the outcomes. So for some people, you may find that you procrastinate and procrastinators get a bad rap, people tend to think that because someone procrastinates that they don't care or they're you know they're they're about death that does, does, does really do care people who procrastinate um they are actually tend to be perfectionists and one of the reasons that they, proc they procrastinate is because their standards for themselves are so high that they put it off put it off and put it off and when that happens you're at risk of overwhelm you rush, you think, I can't do this. I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this. I, everybody else knows more than me. We put it off. We end up rushing last minute. The work ends up not being as good as it could be. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, you can have the micromanagers. You could have a team of people working together and this one person taking everything apart. And it's actually slowing the team down because sometimes good enough is good enough. Yet, you could have someone who is really dedicated to their work, but it's actually slowing down the productivity of a team. And they can be considered the know-it-alls. And in actual fact, they again, they too are perfectionists. They have such high standards for themselves. That's the issue with it. People don't see the implications outside of that. And from that, we can it can lead into anxiety and it can lead into depression. And that's why it's very important for uh, organizations and companies 
needs to recognize this and deal with it early because it has, you know, it has um, well-being implications for their staff, but it also and has implications for their productivity, but it also has financial implications. You're going to have people off sick when they burn out. Yeah. Let's get ahead of it. No, for sure. And uh, do you know what? I'm actually, I've got the opposite problem. I actually jump into things and put things out too quickly before even thinking about it. I'm like, if, if there's... You can give- 51%, if I'm 51% sure of a decision, I go straight away. Um, probably a gift and a curse. Um, procrastination isn't really something that I've suffered from recently, but I certainly have in the past. If, if, for me, it all depends on what you're procrastinating with. Like with schoolwork and university work, I procrastinate like crazy, but with actual yeah. physical building a business work, it's, I, I love doing it. So it's just straight away. Um, and you meant so you mentioned high achievers there why do you think what even though the high achievers have, have achieved a lot already so they've obviously been doing some sort of doing to get to where they are so yeah. how does procrastination affect them at a certain level is it because they get stuck is it because maybe they've got a lot of stress or because they're burnt out is there any particular reason that you see well in terms of, of um, imposter syndrome so you will have the people that will procrastinate and they can't be high achievers. Okay. So they can just reach that point and that's how it manifests at that point. Or you'll have the people who will actually overcompensate. All right. And these can be the really high achievers as well. You'll have the people that feel like I'm really lucky to be here or yeah. people are going to realize, you know, I bluffed that interview. How, and how the hell did I get here? You know, I'm going to, I need to make sure that I earn my place. I've got to take on more. I've got to say yes to everything. I've got to spread myself thin, essentially. And that's what you'll find. And that's what I have found with the clients that tend to be real. They have been taken on more. They have been doing so much extra work. Um, they have been really dedicated to their roles. However, it reaches a point where overwhelm, is, it's hard to sustain, essentially. So while they're trying to sustain that, they eventually reach a burnout level because it's mentally and emotionally draining. You know, once life starts to take hold, people find maybe in their 20s, they were able to dedicate their lives to these roles. They were able to be that workhorse and they were held up on the organization like, God, that, you know, she is killing it or he is killing it. They're fantastic what they do. And then life comes in and then they have children, they have partners, they have other demands on their time. And yet in the background, because they still feel unworthy, it doesn't matter that they have achieved so, so much throughout their career. It's the program and it's still there. You're lucky to be here. You're going to get found out Mm -hmm. that there's still this, this rush, rush, rush to do as much as possible. You know, we see it in big companies where you'll have people working maybe 13, 14 hour days. Yeah. And you may see that with guys guys and girls in their twenties and they're like, no, 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 I love it. I love my work. But when life comes in, and life starts to take over, that becomes very difficult to sustain. And when you don't reach out and you don't ask for help because you have this image that, you know, you're, you're looking to fly under the radar. You don't want to get found out. You're less likely to put your hand up and ask for help and say no. So eventually it gets to the point where overwhelm sets in, anxiety can start setting and you can start thinking about what I have to do today. You know, and that's where, that's where we really need to be careful. I always feel like whenever we talk about um, imposter syndrome, we talk about it as a symptom. I always think if you think of anxiety and depression as like a tree, imposter syndrome is down there in the roots. It isn't a symptom. It's at root level. um, And we need to be able to address it and call it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Unreal. Um, I I love that. love that answer. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Do you know, this is the thing. And there is a lot of hustle, hustle, hustle culture, especially in 2021, where you think everybody's working 20 hours a day and working off four hours sleep. And, you know, that's one of the mistakes I made in the beginning of my career, if you want to call it, you know, the first couple of years building the business. Yes, it was all six, seven day weeks. It was crazy, but it was actually doing nothing to move the needle forward. So eventually I did get burnt out and I had a couple of weeks. There was, there was, there was a point where I actually wanted to just scrap my company altogether and just go, I wanted to go in a different direction. It was so bad. And you can only, you can only hustle so much. And this is when I'm, I'm really trying to become a HR focused company. And what 
all the guys in the industry are telling me they're like keep as many on you know cash subcontractors as possible you know don't don't take on employees don't do this and don't do that and i'm the other way around i'm like no 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 i want my employees to be happy i want them now everybody's working really really hard at the minute they've been prepared for it um but those 12 14 hour days are, are going to destroy people like if you continuously do them week after week after week it will and then when you don't get to do the things you love like going to the gym or going for a walk or spending time with your family or doing whatever it is like everybody's different um, but it certainly has an impact on your mental health it has an impact on your energy it has an impact on your work you don't find that you are as you are as productive you think you're being productive because you're put you're putting the hours in so to speak yeah you, you can put in a 12 i can put in a 14 hour day like i did today and actually get nothing done but then i can put in a four hour day and get a lot done yeah. it all depends on, on what, what, what you're putting your energy and focus on and what your energy levels are like and it's so important that people realize mm-hmm. that taking time off is just as important as working working really hard you have to do both but you gotta you gotta find i don't want to say balance but if you can work your lifestyle and with your work it's always a good um way to do it it is absolutely and i think you know from a employer's point of view you to have that perspective that's that's you know something in your in your team's corner that's like oh you know that's oh thank god I hear, I'm thinking when I hear you saying that when someone's saying you know um, don't take people on but the upside of that the other side of that is don't give people security don't give people safety don't give them you know whenever you're subcontracting all the time again it is you know so then people are, are well I need to keep this guy happy I'm go- I need him to keep coming back to me and I, I completely understand that and when you have that approach of you know that you want to look after people you want them to have their security and their wellness and things like that that's that's really really important and you see that more with employers you know because they get a hard rap everybody assumes that everyone's just out for what they can get but there's actually a lot of compassionate employers out there there's a big emphasis on mental health right now and there's a lot of people tuned into it um, and one thing that's important to remember is that every single one of us has been impacted by mental health in some way so as much I always tell my clients your brain we look at the body and if you had an issue with your lungs and you have difficulty breathing well you would need help and you would be like I need help and yet our lungs and our brain are both organs Yet mm-hmm. we seem to have difficulty computing that this, you know, we need to take as much care of this organ up here. Essentially, this is the control center. We have to take as much care of this control center as we do everything else in our bodies. And that's where, as you said, the word balance, but that's where that comes in as well. It's learning to value your downtime mm-hmm. because you need your downtime to be productive at other times. I have seen so many people say to me, Sam, I have done like long days. I did them myself. I used to get up at half five in the morning, travel to Belfast for work, not get home um, until like eight or 10 o'clock at night and get not get to get very little, not to say get very little done and um, sit and plan ahead for everything I had to do the next day, knowing that I wasn't getting as much done because my brain, I was exhausted. I had had burnout. And that's the implications of not dealing with us at an early stage. That's what so, we're trying, what you're trying to avoid. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, do you know what? I, I know myself so well right now, and I know exactly what I need to do to stop myself from avoiding burnout. And I can feel it coming. I can feel it coming from about maybe a week beforehand if I'm working yeah. too many hours and I'm able to take, luckily enough, I've got a lot of staff in place and things like that. I can take a day off if I need to. Right now, because we're so busy with work, I know that I can push for another couple of weeks and then I'll probably take three or four days off. It's so important to recognize, and this is the thing, you have to go through a period of burnout to recognize what it looks like when it's coming. Um, And it's so important to know yourself and know your body and know what you need to do to prevent it. Because the problem with, when when you're starting to approach burnout, you start to get tired, first of all, right? You start to stay up late. You start to get up early because you're thinking you're getting ahead. Your diet slips, yeah. your exercise slips. Going down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, so you start putting petrol in a diesel engine, essentially. And all yeah. of a sudden you're wondering, why am I not 
performing to my highest level here and it's because you don't actually realize that you're just sort of approaching burnout and then people just get to a stage where they don't want to get out of bed for three or four days I, I don't want to call it depression but you can they're certainly feeling depressed because they're burnt out they have all these things to do they have to get up and they have to get up they've got all these things to do but they don't know why they can't get out of bed or why they don't want to go to work or why they don't want to interact with people why they've got social anxiety and it it's a scary place to be in when you don't know what it is so what absolutely do you, yeah what do you think of the common you know i know you said you work a lot with men at the minute so what are the, if you're approaching burnout what are the sort of common things that are going to happen when, when you're approaching it so you can start to prevent it yeah so if you're in that kind of that sphere where you, you know you have been feeling like um, I'm aware they've got to work extra hard I've got to overcompensate or you know you're starting your own business like you and you think you've got all these doubts in your head and you're plying ahead and you're working so 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 hard um, and you're thinking that you might well you might be at risk of burnout things to look out for are are you starting to dread your days are you getting to the end of the day and starting to dread the next one that's really, really important because if you were enjoying what you were doing before and then you find like, oh, Jesus, I've got to get up and do this tomorrow, tomorrow, again tomorrow. When you say that dread starts to, to come in, start listen to it. I always say, don't, don't dismiss, listen. Pay attention to your thoughts, okay? Um, physically, how are you feeling physically? Are you feeling exhausted? Are you tired than usual? Are you snapping at people? Is your tolerance lower? Look out for those types of changes in your mood. Yeah, and the thing is, oftentimes when people do experience this burnout, particularly people with imposter syndrome and anxiety, they will they will be in bed and they will, you know, but once they reach that stage where they have to step away from their work um, and they, they'll be they'll be in their bed or they'll be lying under the duvet, they'll be struggling to get up, but their mind is going 90 miles an hour. They are aware that they are missing work. They are aware that it is building up. And this, this pit, this hole, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And something has got to give. Mm -hmm. Something has got to give. And so it's, it's recognize you need to get ahead of it. You say you have to go through it to, to, you know, to recognize it. On some level, yes. I think a lot of us, even like when you were a student, we all recognized you know, burning that midnight oil. When, yeah. when we were doing that, if you're studying for yeah, GCSEs, you can do, you can do that when you're 18 you know? or 19 or 20. You know, <laughs> I could have partied yeah, for two, two days straight when I was 18, 19, 20. Now I can't even stay up past 12. <laughs> uh, I, I was know? actually just joking. I could have hammered out an essay after a night out at six o'clock in the morning and handed it on the 12. You know, those days are gone. Yeah, they're long gone. <laughs> those days oh. are long, long gone. There's definitely cognitive decline with me on that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you'll recognize that, you know, from those days and just it's being aware and not letting it reach that point. Are you getting sick? Do you notice that your immune system's taking a hit? And that's a big one. Okay, because I'm guilty too. We're, none of us are perfect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember, was it about four or five months ago? I just kept coming down with things. And during that time, I was really busy, as you know, as I said, because I, I work, I study for my postgrad, um, I started to take coach as well. And one of my colleagues was like, Sam, did it ever occur to you that you're you're a bit stressed? Mm -hmm. That you're, you know, you're doing too much. And I was like, yep. oh, okay. Because my immune, your immune system, your body will tell you. And it's so important mm -hmm. to deal with that before it gets to a stage where it becomes a real problem. When it gets to the stage when you're repeatedly taking time off work. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're someone who was really dedicated, you keep getting sick, you're taking time off, your boss is flagging it up. It's, it's having the awareness to get ahead of it and recognize it, but not just recognize the burnout, recognize why. Why do you have burnout? Why are you overcompensating? Why are you working so hard? You can have it for any number of reasons, but you need to know the why, because in order to change any behavior pattern, you've got to know why you're doing it. Well, I can you have to be able to identify that. I, I, can, I can tell you from a business owner's perspective, why I work so hard and why I feel like I have to put the hours in that nobody else does. Because, you know, there's times where I feel like I don't want to be seen by my staff as somebody who is doing less hours than them. And that's, yeah. and that's a perfectly normal thing for a business owner to feel. But, however, whenever you are a business owner and you are working in your business all the time and you're doing nothing to move the needle forward, 
you're you, then you're you're not challenging yourself first of all you're not you're not progressing which and, and as tony robbins always says progression equals happiness but yeah. certainly business owners definitely feel like they are the one who have to be putting more hours in than everybody else which i can absolutely you know agree with because i've been there i still go through the same thing sometimes you feel almost guilty for taking a day off um yeah and, and it's hard because especially in busy times when it's crunch time the my, my belief is when it's crunch time especially in sort of project-based businesses you know client services and things like that the leader should be there all, uh, most of the time obviously within within reason of course but you you if you if it's crunch time and work and your staff have taken up and they're, and they're under pressure and you're not there that's not a good sign but at the same time when things are sort of running along nicely then yes you need to take time off but not just for downtime but to do things that are going to move the needle forward because when you start when, you, when you're progressing and you're moving the needle forward in your business you do feel happy you don't get burned out as quickly because you're doing different things every day it's like when you're doing the same thing every day you can get burnt out especially when you're not moving anywhere especially when your team's under pressure uh and you know yeah. it's just that that that's from a business owner perspective but it's it's very very hard to break that i think yeah and i say it's interesting you say but you know you worry about people what your team are going to think if you are seen to slow down as well and i think that a lot of business owners get that as well they're like i have to keep pushing i have to keep you know maybe it could be at a time when they probably quite rightly you know could maybe get a break but they're like no do you know what i need them to see me push on i need them to realize that i'm you know as they are they're going to think that i'm x y and z if they don't see me you know putting in these hours and things too and that's just it's it's very very human and it makes sense but one of the reasons that you own a business is to be able to be in the position as well so that you you can have a team around you to support you and still be able to say do you know what today i'm going to have a family day today mm. i'm going to you know and it's utilizing that and not getting lost and that i have to or other people will think and believe me that's the one that we that's a rabbit hole we all go down it, it's um, something that's that's the most human one isn't it it's like <laughs> God, what are other people going to think? Um, and yeah. you talk about moving the needle forward. Like you said, nothing happens in your comfort zone. You've got to get out of it. Growth happens outside of your comfort zone. And I, I'm a big believer in that, even in terms of CBT. You know, whenever we are taking on patients for CBT, one of the, the um, criteria that we look when we're doing a risk assessment is, is this person happy to be a bit uncomfortable at times? We tell yeah. them, yeah. I'm going to ask you to do things that will make you uncomfortable. Why? Because like you said, Chris, we've got to move the needle forward. Yep. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's where, that's where people get caught. They're, they're caught between working in the business because they want to be seen as the person who's side by side, but by, by the side of all their staff and they're the person who can do everything and they want yeah. to prove themselves. And it's like, then they're not doing the things that they should be doing. And then they wonder why they're going nowhere. They wonder why they haven't made any progression in a year. They wonder why they have the, you know, their business, they're stressful. They wonder why their customer service isn't great because they're not focusing on the things they need to be focusing on because they want to, they want to stay doing everything in their business. Yeah. And it, when, when you stay doing everything and you can't delegate anything, you can't let go of control. I can guarantee you that is the quickest way that you're going to get burnt out. You need to have a team. You need to be yeah. able to delegate you need to be able to let go of control. You need somebody to turn around who, uh, who's in your business and turns around to you as a leader and says, I've got this, leave me to it. And once you can start to do that with the, peop the people you trust, your life becomes a lot easier and you do not get burnt out as quickly. You can't put more hours in, but you're putting them in doing the right things and the things you enjoy. And it's trust in your judgment too, because when you think about it, you sat down you interviewed this person, you knew the skills you wanted from them. You know, they obviously passed interview. So you saw something in them. And yet when you have them there, and this is the class, this is the micromanager. So when we talked about all different types of imposter syndrome and things we do, this is the micromanaging thing that can actually slow your team down. Yeah. So it's that perfectionism again, because it's your baby, because it's your company, you know exactly how you want things to be done. And then we can end up having difficulty letting other people come in and lift the burden off us. But essentially from a business point of view, you're actually throwing away dead money because you're paying for a skill and you're not letting the person use it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and you're showing lack of faith in your own judgment because you've chosen them. 
yeah, you chose that person. When you micromanage people, it's probably one of the. <laughs> I mean, you can have you have yes. your systems and your process and how you like things done. People are always going to do things a little bit differently, and you, you know, just just leave people to it. Just leave, let let your team. And you know what? If they mess it up and they're you, they're not the right fit or whatever, then that's fine. Then you can step back in or you can do whatever you have to do. But what I find is when I just leave people to it. They, they always do better than what I think. When I, I, like I, have, I have a saying in my business, unless it's going to cost me any more than £300, I don't want to make the decision. <laughs> you make the decision. And that Very decision good. served me quite well. So the guys only ever, uh, the guys only ever fool me if something's going to cost me more than £300. If they they're only sweating a bit then. <laughs> they're only sweating a bit. And, I, you know, even if it's 299 you know, that's the rule I put in place. So I can't. I, but like it's it, it basically just it basically just shows them I trust you make the decision yeah. it's fine if you mess it up you mess it up it's no big deal we'll readjust mm-hmm. you'll learn and we'll move on but you've got to be willing yeah when you're delegating you've got to be willing for your team to make mistakes nobody is going to come in have your systems and your processes and have them down to a fine art straight away it takes time it takes time for people to grow into a role so yeah um delegation big one and, for burnout and nobody thinks like you chris you know what i mean your mind your mind is unique nobody thinks the way that you think and then if we're in that quest for perfectionism and we're in that quest you know for for to get everything 100 percent for everyone to do everything the way that we do it but they don't have our mind they don't think the way we think everybody thinks individually and that's why they have the talent and skills that they do that's why we employ them we mm-hmm. don't employ someone who thinks exactly what we think because then you're not going to have any innovation you're going exactly. to have more of the same. And you're going to have no culture that, either. There's going to be no culture if you're micromanaging everybody. Absolutely. And it's, it's having faith, you know. And the, the other thing I wanted to say on that is if you're aiming for that perfectionism all the time and you're expecting people to, to do things perfect or I'll just do it myself, you're essentially setting yourself and them up for failure. Mm-hmm. Because there's only, when, when you have the bar up here, you may hit that sometimes, but that is very very difficult to sustain Mm -hmm. and eventually you know it's going to slip down below and if you're if you're you're sometimes I say sometimes good enough is good enough yeah so if somebody can do the job and it's not the way that you would have done it and it isn't you know 99.9 out of 100 but it's 85 and it's good enough Mm-hmm. then sometimes that's good enough and you have to learn to step back because that person's never going to get to 99 if they don't get to practice you're essentially setting them up for failure yeah they're never they're never going to reach their full potential if, if, if i'm breathing down their neck anyway so i just leave them to it um, yeah that's brilliant that's really really good though <laughs> that you have the faith and the foresight to do that with your team i don't want to be breathing down people's necks i don't want to be <laughs> i don't want people phoning me 10 times a day for every little thing I've got enough on my plate to worry about. So I just leave them to it. And I just say, look, if there's anything that you've got an issue about, write it down, send me a quick email at the end of the day and I'll have a look at it. But generally, my team don't really contact me unless there's something important. Now, we are actually in a, in a phase at the minute where because we've got such a lot on, um, we're li- not, not short staff. We've got the right amount of staff members, but I'm doing a lot of the, the work, like the additional work. Without me, I don't really want to start recruiting new people in because then I think mm-hmm. our standards will drop. But I'm at a point now where the next two weeks are going to be pretty chaotic for me. I've accepted that. And we're, we're just trying to keep pushing on. But yeah, the staff certainly don't want me breathing down their neck. And um, yeah. they, they don't want to be micromanaged. Nobody wants to be micromanaged either. Yeah. I like what you said. Like you said, that they don't, they rarely contact you. And that's probably because you've given them enough room to know what they need you know they probably learned it they've probably had to contact you at the start i imagine when things get up and running they've learned what they need to do now their skills are up their confidence in themselves is up they know you've got confidence in them so it works exactly. you know what you do works from that point of view as well so yeah it's really really important to, to kind of have that ability to kind of step back and and, ha- and have faith and your judgment because you pick those people yeah. you know what it yeah. comes down to it's not just having faith in them it's having faith in your judgment when you put those people in those roles that was the decision that you made um and so not second guessing yourself yeah exactly so let's uh, well actually one of <laughs> i got so caught up in that topic there it was a really really good in-depth discussion about that um but i really wanted to go on and talk mainly about men so i know you yeah. work with a lot of men why do you think men struggle with their mental health more 
I mean, the, the stats are obvious. The suicide rate is much higher for men. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of statistics there to back it up. I, have, I don't want to go yeah. on and say anything more in case of someone misquotes me, but I no. think the suicide rate's much higher. Um, and then yeah. why, why do you think that is? Why do you think we struggle so much? Do you know what? When you're talking about the suicide rate being higher, I'm one of the very morbid people who reads the coroner's reports um, that come out every couple of years. And in terms of those stats, I mean, they're not just higher, they're chronic. Um, right. So men in Northern Ireland are three times more likely to complete suicide than women. We have the highest rate in the entire of the UK. So you look at a big, big city like London or anywhere like that, we are our, our stats are through the roof. They are so, so high. Um, and men are particularly at risk, especially men in the 18 to 45 year old bracket, the, the, the risk is extremely high. And there's many reasons for that. First of all, Northern Ireland, it's, there is a legacy from the troubles. So there is potential that you will have parents who maybe experienced trauma and the troubles yeah. that wasn't dealt with going on to raise children who are re-traumatized because, you know, of their experience of loving you know what the parents again not dealt with and so this accum can accumulate throughout it you can may find that it's like a, a family um thing that you know my, my granda had ptsd and my, my dad had depression and you know it's it can actually stem back from the the trouble so there is research indicating that the troubles has left a legacy of mental health trauma in northern ireland and that's something that we hold unique um to other places whenever we're comparing ourselves so we we have that that's one of the things that that's an issue secondly there the stigma now the stigma has gotten better it absolutely has um you know men, men are more forthcoming but by the time guys reach me usually um it's crisis they're presenting to me in crisis and one of the reasons that that happens is because talking about mental health isn't normalized amongst men you have that toxic language of man up you know that one yeah I've one of my favorite yeah, heard them all. <laughs> yeah um and you have that toxic rhetoric uh that young men are hearing um yes. that basically shame being put on them at the you know at, for, for wanting to discuss their emotions so they don't discuss them and other guys that they maybe if they did feel like talking about them other guys aren't on that same level they're not they can't talk, talk about it with them so they might find somebody's ready to open up but their friend is not able to talk about mental health or emotions at all. So they again withdraw and retreat. And what happens is it gets bottled and bottled and bottled until it reaches a pressure point. And this is the issue with Northern, with Northern Ireland with men's mental health. We need to get in there earlier. We need to remove the stigma. We need to get people talking. We need to make shame should be not for someone who wants to talk about their mental health, Shame should be applied to those who try and shame people for talking about their mental health. That's yeah, well, the stigma should yeah. not be, you know, the way that it is. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been part of, you know, clubs and, you know, boxing clubs, MMA clubs, everything. And there's a lot of lad culture, you know, especially in like football teams, rugby teams. I mean, if you have an insecurity, your teammates are going to pick it out and they are going to torture you about it. That is the way it is. Now, you're either going to go one of two ways. You're going to go and you're going to develop a really strong mindset, be able to laugh it off um, and, and continue that way. Or you're going to become very self-conscious. You're going to become very insecure. So it's all going to depend on your state of emotion and your emotional self-control, which way you're going to go. And unfortunately for a lot of these guys, they're going the other way where they're getting insecure, they're becoming self-conscious. You know, I, I know a lot of men who are getting a lot of, you know, work done to themselves, like uh, definitely an surgery, increase, yeah. Her transplants, anything you can name, any insecurity that they've been picked on since they were a kid. Now, I was fortunate enough when I was a kid. I, when I was a kid, I actually got bullied, so I was able to overcome that as a child. I, I, I don't want to say fortunate, but back in the nineties, being bullied was different than being bullied today. You know, you maybe got a you got a, maybe a couple of hidings or you get tortured in school and that was it once once sort of primary school was over it was done and then after that when you go into your teenage years you start to develop a bit of self-confidence i was able to do that luckily through like boxing through working out through getting a job in the hilton hotel where i was forced to socialize with people so i was quite fortunate in my later teens that i made the right decisions to sort of improve my self-confidence but 
a lot of people just don't do it. And then they become socially anxious. And men just, and then there, there is that lad culture, you know, if you turn around to one of your mates on a football team and say, look, I'm really struggling with my mental health here, exactly like you say, they'll go man up or they'll be like, oh, you know, they might turn around and say, Johnny's crying about something that's happening outside of the football team. And then the next thing, the, the, the poor guy feels like he can't talk and then it just bottles up. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. that's the way it is. They go one or two ways, but they don't know who to talk to, number one. And number two, they don't know how to express themselves whenever they do have a problem. Yeah, and it's really, it's unfortunate. Now, it's, I can see huge progress. Um, I have worked with a lot of um, footballers um, and a lot of guys, you know, that are big into the sports and things like that. And I can definitely, definitely see progress. And what you find is like, once you get guys coming through, the next couple of guys come through, will be saying, you know, so he, he, you know, he told me about the help that he got. And if they start to pay it forward and word does, it's like a trickle and it spreads out. And, you know, you need that you need guys coming through you having that positive experience and saying listen I got help and let me tell you I changed everything you know and this is who I went to this is the help that's out there and it takes the stigma away and oftentimes it's more senior guys in the team who will do it once they've been through that you know they, they, they will trick it will trickle down then to the younger guys in the team and can help change a culture within the team yeah absolutely it can um but it's getting that message out there for men that it's 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 okay to talk it's good to do it sooner rather than later it's you know get in there before it reaches crisis point and we do see guys you know coming back because i i work obviously for a, a, a mental health charity and we would see guys coming back through that maybe were coming back um from a couple of years before and they're saying you know what things are just creeping up so i want to get ahead of it and do you mind if i book back in with such and such for a few sessions and we love seeing that yeah. Because they've then developed the skills to recognize when things are getting to a certain point and to know to come away and talk about it and deal with it so that they can go forward. They don't end up in that crisis again. Yeah. And that's what we really want to see. So there's a big, big push to let men know, you know, it's, it's actually the easiest thing. I tell my clients this all the time, every time I get someone, because I find men to be quite apologetic coming through. Um, and I tell them, listen here, what you've just done today was actually the hardest thing you could have done. The mm. easiest thing you could have done was stick your head in the sand. The hardest thing was to put a hand up and ask for help. It, it would yeah, have been so much yeah. easier for you not to do that. Yeah, you know? for sure. I think, I think Tyson Fury, when he won his fight against Deontay Wilder, was a huge part of playing that. The mental battle that he overcome to come back and then win the heavyweight championship of the world very openly talks about his mental health problems as a man gives people a lot of advice which is basically the same thing i would say is sort of set small goals everybody always everybody's like i mean we all have big goals and big dreams that we're working towards and that's great but at the end of the day you know there there is that there's a lot of pressure on both men and women this is not not just for men but there's all these people in the world saying you know don't dare to dream too big you know you know, don't, don't have realistic goals. And that puts a lot of pressure on people. You need yeah. to have small daily goals because it's small daily actions that compound into a great goal. But the problem most people is, is they lack the patience. They lack the patience to do the compounding small goals every single day, take the right actions. And then a few years later, you know, if you were, if you were to tell someone to wait a few years on a goal and just be patient, everybody wants everything immediately but there, there is a lot of pressure on people to, to have these big grand dreams and everybody has to start the next million dollar business or million pound business or they have to create mm. this six-figure coaching academy i'm just going by things to see on instagram but there's a lot of pressure on people to yeah. create that and when they, they, they feel like they can't do it or they feel like they're getting nowhere then they start to feel depressed and start the mental health starts to suffer yeah, and one of the things I would say to that is, you know, one of the advantages of small goals, if we look at depression and anxiety, there is a correlation between depression, anxiety, and self-esteem, okay? Mm-hmm. If you have very low self-esteem and you're setting yourself these astronomical goals and you don't get it the first time, you're more likely to take that bad, okay, than someone who has really high self-esteem and might just say, well, I'm going to go at it even harder next time. Mm-hmm. But if you set yourself um you know small realistic goals 
by achieving those on a daily basis and just increasing it slightly in increments, you're improving your self-esteem. You're getting that sense of accomplishment. So for, I mean, I, same, the goals I set with my clients can be really simple. They can be get out of bed. See, tomorrow morning, whenever I phone you, we'll make a deal. Just be out of bed. Be serious, Samantha, yeah. Be yeah. out of bed. When I phone you tomorrow, the goal for tomorrow is be out of bed. Now, the goal the next day would might be be out of bed and have it be showered, you know. And then, I mean, we can start. So that's, that's somebody, you know, in mental health crisis. But when we apply that then to daily life, especially people with low self-esteem, right, you want to start a business. What's a realistic goal that we can set for this week? Not a big one, like, you know, I need to turn over 100 grand by the end of the week. What's a realistic? Well, I could set up some social media. There's a realistic goal. You can achieve that. You can yeah. measure it because you can see that it's done. And that gives you the reinforcement and sense of accomplishment. Rather than setting ourselves up for failure, when we set the, we try to conform to unrealistic expectations, we set ourselves up for failure. It reinforces them feelings of low self-esteem, anxiety, depression. We are left wide open to it. Yeah, so absolutely. It's, and it's, it's, it's being aware. Absolutely. I mean, there's, sorry, excuse me. I just <laughs> had to cut this, but I just was about to sneeze there. <laughs> um, bad hay fever i've got really really bad hay fever the minute the pollen's killing me oh you're you're grand <laughs> um i i was talking to somebody about this the other week this concept of a six-figure business everybody wants you know i can help you hit six figures i can help you hit six figures and it's like well you know and i and i've actually had people to me saying oh, i really want to hit six figures and i'm like well why do you want to hit six figures this year i mean hitting six figures is great when, when you hit it but you don't feel any different it doesn't do anything for you there, I, I say why don't you why don't you try and hit yourself a 20% net profit after you've been paid within your business goal after you've been paid whatever salary you want and then you can start to build your revenue from there and that's that, that, that that's mm -hmm. kind of the way I would view those kind of goals like you could hit you could hit six figures in business but you're if you, if you hit 100 grand next year your outgoings might be 150 grand, depending on what you're selling and what you're doing. Um, you know, what stage of business you're at, you may need to be reinvested more time. So hitting six figures is no good, but why don't you try and focus on giving yourself the salary you want and then hitting a small percentage of profit. And then you can start to build on that. And, and it, it, when you can reframe it like that, especially in terms of a business goal, it, it's much better. But there's just so, there's, there's so many, there is a lot of pressure on people, especially people who are entrepreneurs, which is the cool thing to be these days. Uh, there's just so much pressure on them to build the next amazing big yeah. business. And on Instagram and social media, it looks like they're doing it. You know, they've got the flashy stuff. They've got whatever they've got. But the reality is being a business owner and being an entrepreneur is a fucking nightmare. It's tough work. You've got to have a really resilient mind and you've got to really put the hours in and it's not about Instagram and it's not about being flashy there. If you don't, if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't look after your mental and physical health, when you're an entrepreneur, you're going to, you're going to suffer severely from mental health problems. You're going to get burnout. You're going to have potential financial implications. You could lose a lot of money. You could lose your assets. So you've got to really be careful um, when you're thinking about getting it, getting into this uh, space because it is very difficult. Yeah, and I think one of the things too I say to people is start thinking about the what, like the what, what you want. Start thinking about the why. The why. Why do you want it? It's yeah. not the what, okay. it's the why. Why do you want it? Um, why are you doing, you know, a, 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 another thing is setting yourself up for failure. Why are you doing something that you don't like doing? Yes, you're, you're bringing in income from it, but you're going to your work every day, miserable. How long are you going to sustain that? It's not the what, it's the why. If you're doing something because you've got a vision and you've got it, you know, a clear outline of what you want and you're passionate about it and you're invested in it, then the putting in those hard hours isn't as difficult, especially if you've got realism there and you're realistic. But if you're doing something because, you know, you want to make X amount of money and someone else online has told you you can make this if you do this course and you jump through these hoops and whatever else, um, then you're, you're setting yourself up for a very, very difficult situation for a lot of pressure. Um, and there's a a good probability you're setting yourself up for failure so it's not the what it's the why 
you need to know why you want to do this. And I think that's another thing too. You will have people, I think at the minute, there's this massive um, culture online now for these guys to come along with no background in anything like mental health or anything. And they've decided, you know, um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to coach women to do whatever. And, but the thing is, if you're not passionate about that, if you're not invested in that, if you're not educated in that area, that's going to be a very difficult thing for you to do. Um, and so you're setting yourself up this very difficult scenario. And it, it's not about the what, it's the why. Why do you want to do that? What's pulled you into this area? What's your background? What's your passion? You know, is there something else that you would rather be doing? Let's look at that. You know, you, you've, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. It's, what a great answer as well. You know, why, why do you want all these things? You know, why not think about creating a life that you're proud of? Why not create a business yeah. around your life? I'm just, for, I, I can't really speak for anybody else. I, 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 love, I love business. I love building my business. So I can get up in the morning if I can get to the gym every day or the majority of the time, if I can walk my dog every day and I can spend a little bit of time alone in the evening before I go to bed, I am happy. Then I have weekends mm -hmm. off. You know, I'm happy. That, 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 that's all I really like in a day. I don't have any kids, but when kids come, that will obviously be another priority. But at the moment, you know, why not, why not think about creating a life that you love? What is it mm -hmm. you want to do on a daily basis? What are the things you love? What are your hobbies? What are your passions? How are you going to implement them in and build your business around that? Because it can be done. And when you start thinking like that, building the life that you want, where do you want your life to be in six months? Where do you want your life to be in 12 months? How do you want your days to look? Then that's when you can start to really put in a plan. It's like, well, I want to earn six figures. Okay, well, do you want to work 15 hours a day and not have any social life? You know, there's a lot of, a yeah. lot of things around that. So I think people really just need to start changing the question and think about what they want in their life and think about what makes them tick, what is going to get them up early in the morning and what's going to get their juices going. And then just success start looks like different create. things to different folks, doesn't it? Like, you know, success might look to someone like six figures. Um, success might look to someone, you know, um, just like having what we talked about balance, you know, doing a job that they like and being comfortable. That yeah. to some people is success. Having time in the evening to spend with the kids, having time to invest in the hobbies and things that they love. That might be it for some people. That's what success looks like. And so it is, it's about what drives you, what, do, what does it look like to you? Because we really do need, we do need to redefine, especially from a mental health perspective, we absolutely need to redefine this notion of success. Um, you know, what's been pushed in front of our faces and social media and on the media, that's not necessarily success because I've worked with those guys. Yeah. And I can tell you right now, they don't feel successful. You're looking at them I, thinking that the grass is greener, but they don't feel successful because there's something else in their life. Maybe they're not getting any time with the kids. Maybe their marriage is going through difficulties. You know, maybe they, they earned this big salary and the job isn't secure and they've got themselves, you know, they're, they're, they're worried in case there would be debt there in the future. Nobody knows what's going on in your own backyard. And so you need to really sit down and think about what success looks like to you, not the guy across the street, not the guy in the fancy car. But what does it look like to you? I, you know, I get this all the time. I drive around in an 800 pound caddy. I bought for 800 quid and I love it. It's so low tech. It's amazing. I can fit all the boxes in the back of it. I can fit rubbish. In it. I love it. But people You need say, to take you know, a selfie and put it on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> checking out my new whip. Um, yeah. They, people say to me all the time, like, why, why, don't you get a, why don't you get yourself a nice car? Like, you're doing really well at the minute. And I'm like, because the only... There's only one car I've ever wanted to own and it's, it's a Mitsubishi Barbarian. And the only reason I want to own it is because I owned one before and I bought it before I could afford it. So then I had to get rid of it and it really yeah. devastated me. But if I was going to buy a fancy car tomorrow, it would just be, I would just be buying it for other people. There's only one car I want. It's a Jeep. But I, like, I mean, in terms of happiness, money, success, I know a lot of people who portray all the success the Rolexes, the fancy cars, and I've met them, and they're some of the most insecure people I've ever met. Yeah. Luckily, doing, doing what I do, I get to meet a lot of people. Um, I think I'm quite a good judge of character, and I've, you know, I'm very, very good with people. And I meet them, they're very insecure. You know, they're worried about how they look, and, and, and you can just see it. And it's like, 
you're portraying one thing on social media and then the opposite is yeah you know when you meet you in real life it's just not the same so I, I would encourage everybody like I'm just as happy when I first started my business I was earning I think I was paying myself like a thousand pound a month which is ridiculous that's no money at all um obviously I was lucky being you know just I maybe had a little bit of, of cash coming in too but like I was paying myself very little so I could reinvest and reinvest and reinvest and I can tell you now, I am no more happy today than what I was three years ago, four years ago, because I just love doing what I was doing. I get more excited buying furniture blankets and new equipment for our, for our customers than I do buying myself stuff. So uh, yeah, definitely really encourage people to start thinking about what they really want and what do you want your life to look like? Just write it down. What do you want to be able to do on a daily basis? Do you want to be able to spend an hour with your kids? Do you want to be able to go to the golf course for an hour? start thinking about it and then start creating a life that is going to gear you towards that because that'll become that'll come much much easier than trying to earn a certain amount of money or trying to buy a car or trying to do all this stuff um it's much more realistic it, it takes time but if you're working towards that that'll make you much much happier than an arbitrary number absolutely i couldn't agree with you more um that's true you know one of the things i laugh because um yeah. i always kind of kind of define myself as a little bit of a socialist i just like I've got you know a lot of socialist ideals. Um, uh, right, so I, have a capitalist. So I, I don't do what I do. Not, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it's a bad word. And then they're like, "But you're but you're starting a business," and I'm like, "I know, I know." It's a catch twenty two. Um, oh, but I have always believed, right. yeah. But I've always believed that enough is enough. Um, so that's my own personal view. You know, I'm very comfortable with having enough. So I love that the fridge is stocked. I love that we can go to Donegal at the yes. weekend and get away I love that you know where I live there's a beautiful river nearby me and I can go and walk by it and that that's those are the things that matter to me mm-hmm. but you're not me so that might not yeah. be what you love and so it's just about knowing yourself and making sure that any goals you set for yourself they're not somebody else's we yeah. really do need to hone down on the social media thing you need to understand nobody puts well very few people put their worst days on social media yeah. Very few people will put up a picture of an empty fridge because they're struggling financially. The, the representation <laughs> my fr- my that you see is broke. I'll not take real. a picture of mine. <laughs> you put up your broken fridge. Yeah. I have a broken fridge. I've been fridge. living off uh, cre- I've been living off Creighton's um, salt and chili chicken meals for a couple of weeks now. Oh, um, Jesus. You're going to have a sick stomach. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, look, I, I can, that, it's, again, another great answer. And just off the back of that, I want to say, you know, I'm not specifically driven by money, um, but I mean, I earn enough. But to, if you are, that's okay. The thing is, yeah, it's about knowing I mean, what you want. That's the thing. It's about what what do you want and not what you think you should want. What do you want? What exactly? That's the I mean, thing. I, I, I pay myself a, a healthy salary now. I save the majority of it. I'm able to live the life that I want. I'm doing, able to do most of the things that I want. Sometimes things happen when you're in business, but that's part of being an entrepreneur. It doesn't look the same every single day. Sometimes you've got crisis to deal with. But, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, if you are going to start a business, it needs to make money. It needs to be able to sustain itself and it needs to be able to sustain itself without you doing all of the work too. So I think that's important to add, you know, your business has yeah. to make making money. And yes, you need to be able to sustain your lifestyle. And I think it's important for people to realize that they need to save too. You know, you need to be able to save for your financial security as well. You know, do something you're passionate about. Don't be driven specifically by money, but your business does need to make, make money. I don't know that's a, a bit of a, a counter and the sa- pr- no, counterproductive no, the thing, thing is, but to sustain itself and to grow it needs to make but money. But it's true. It's yeah. so, so true. And that's just, just because, you know, I have all these like socialist idea- ideals and I'm a little bit of a happy in that way. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, there's anything wrong with that. And what you said there that was really important that I think people need to hear too is people think, I need to get this, this and this and then go out and buy this, that and the other. And what you said was people need to learn to save. Yeah. Things happen. Um, and that's also really important yeah and so that that's putting yourself under you know pressure to have um when when you have you have no safety net there Mm um isn't always a good isn't always a good thing yeah well i'm fortunate that uh, yeah you do absolutely you need to really you need to be able to save money you need to have some sort of financial security there i'm just very fortunate in the fact that there's no fear in me to have to start again like if anything Mm -hmm. was never hit the fan 
it doesn't bother me. I mean, I, I kind of like starting up. I like Here we go like, again. You go like that. Kinda, Here we go like, again. Yeah, in a, in, a, in a sick way, yeah. But I, I mean, I wouldn't want to tomorrow, but if it happened, it happened. And it's just one of those things. But not everybody feels like that. Some people think that they're only going to hit the lottery once. I kind of feel mm-hmm. like I could do it again and again and again if I need to. I know I can operate and run a business. I know I can grow a business. So it's it's just important. That, that's my safety net that I could do it again. Um, you look at Alan Sugar. I mean, the man had to do it over and over again didn't he you know that he didn't he didn't just do it once he had to do it over and over again and that's a faith in your skills that you have that not you know some people don't have that and that's a good question to ask yourself do you have faith that if you needed to do this again could you do it all the time i kind of wish it's self-belief that some days days (laughs) Uh, just to do it again because it's fun it's fun for me um yeah so what why why did you why did you want to start your business like why did you want to yeah, the reason that I wanted to start was essentially like I like I was saying. So I was seeing these clients, and I was seeing this pattern emerging, mm-hmm. um, where you know there's we have these so-called high achievers, and then we have this thing that's lurking under the surface that nobody seems to call out. Now, if you go and you look up online, there's research into it, and there's research into the imposter syndrome and the links to depression and anxiety and mental health as my passion. There's just no two ways about it. They say, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And if you see me so far, like my mouse just goes 90 miles an hour when I talk about <laughs> mental health. Um, you know, it's, so again, it's it, you need to be invested in it. So for me, I see this as, you know, this is something that needs looked at. Um, it needs looked at before that burnout stage. It needs looked at before people start taking sick days um, and before the pressure starts piling on. And that for me is I always wanted to be self-employed actually years ago when I was really young, right before I had my really young boy when I was in my 20s. Um, I did open up a shop around the time of the recession and it was a dress shop. Um, I decided to take time out from everything. My daughter had been really, really sick and couldn't really give my time to looking after other people when she was so unwell basically that's the way I felt and so I took time out and one of the things I did was I started my own business and it was like a dress shop now that it was in the middle of a recession and I kid you not uh when you opened on a Monday morning like there was literally nowhere no in in a small town um and in Northern Ireland there was nobody about it was like a ghost town it was the worst time to do it but I did it I stayed open for a year and I broke even which I was quite proud of um, so that entrepreneurial thing was always in me. I always wanted to work for myself, but I wasn't as invested in that. That was just like, you know, mm-hmm. something that I, I, I thought, right, I'll try my hand at this. But it has always lurked under the surface, you know, that I would like to work for myself and that I would like to, you know, um, tra- to eventually train up my own team as well and put out the message of mental health in the way that I think it should be delivered, which is at root level. Not when we see the repercussions of it, but when we can see the very beginnings, and I honestly believe with my heart and soul that when we look at imposter syndrome, I don't think it's a symptom. I, I truly believe that it is. Um, it's there at root level. It's a causal factor. And mm-hmm. if we can get in and we can recognize those things, like, you know, why you other other sides of it can be, you might find you have somebody who um, doesn't make great eye contact, doesn't engage well with their colleagues. People think she's stuck up. What you might find is there's also what I call the coasters. And I admit to being one of these, the whole way through school, I was such a coaster. It isn't even funny. I didn't want to come up on your radar for anything. I didn't want to come up on your radar for being in the bottom of the class. And I didn't want to come up on your radar for being at the top of the class because there was still potential. You could find me out. Um, I was so, so guilty of this whenever I was younger. So I was one of the coasters. And what you do is you're just trying to fly under the radar all the time. Yeah. And so when you get into meetings and things like that, you might have all this brilliance in your head, but you don't offer it up. All right. Yeah. Your, your self-esteem isn't high enough. Everybody else knows more than me. And you don't offer it up and you don't you don't come forward with that. And you end up holding that in. Your boss misses out in the potential that they know you have because, you know, at interview stage, they saw it in you. But here you are holding it back. And so from a mental health point of view, it manifests itself in so many ways. People come to me and say, Samantha, nobody likes me in the office. They all think that I'm stuck up. In reality, I just don't want to draw attention to myself. Yep. But what can happen there is this as initially something that looks like a small problem, this isolation can end up turning into something like social phobia. You know, I hate going into the office. I feel like they're all talking about me. Nobody likes me. People are judging me. And so it's getting in there at that root level. And I think that that's why I am. Um, 
I took took it upon myself to start up Haiku Coaching was because I felt like we need to get in there in the early stages before mm-hmm. it reaches the stage where it's full blown anxiety, before you're taking three weeks off your work, you know, before before it's depression. Get in there, get in there, they deal, deal with it, identify it. The most the easiest thing to do is just give it a name. Yeah. When you hear yourself saying things like, you know, I don't fit in here. If you ever walked into a room and there's like 30 people in the room and you're like, oh my God, I do not belong here. Yeah. When you hear that, call it out. Call it out. That's what that is. That's imposter syndrome. It's essentially what it is. You're waiting for everyone to find out that you shouldn't be there. Call it out and deal with it at that stage before it escalates. Um, and I'm really, really passionate about that yeah. because I see so many people coming through and it started with those that lose the self-doubt and it mm-hmm. continued and continued until it became a full-blown uh, mental health problem impacting on their work or their home life. And it doesn't need to be that way if we can get on there early enough and, and put the support yeah. in place. Lo- love that answer. You can obviously tell you're really passionate about it, which is fantastic. You need to tell me when to stop because I just go like that <laughs> when I start talking about we'll, it. We'll, we'll, finish, we'll finish up with the final question. So if you, if one of somebody out there, you know, man, woman, whatever it is, um, if they're struggling with their mental health, they feel like they want to talk to somebody, but they can't because they're afraid of everything that I talked about earlier, you know, the lads being in front of them, they're afraid to speak up because of, you know, what may be said, will they be seen as weak? What advice would you give to those people? Well, first of all, I would say to them, listen, those days are gone. Those days are gone. Look around your circle. All right. It's very unlikely that within your circle, everyone will be of the one opinion. All right. Um, so if, if within your circle of friends, it's very unlikely everyone is going to have that mentality. Yes, there will be people. But when we're struggling with our mental health, our brain is fine tuned to focus in on the negative. OK, that's what it does. It's fight or flight. So it focuses in on threats. So we're going to focus in on that judgment and think, oh, my God, they're all judging me. We're not looking at the people over the other side of the room that aren't judging me. Reach out to an organization close to you of counselors. Um, there's been plenty of charities, depending on where you are, charitable organizations offering counseling. You know, you can't, there's not, we're unshockable. You know, I'm a mental health nurse. There isn't anything you can say to me that's going to make me judge you. And you'll mm-hmm. find that with other mental health professionals as well. We're completely unshockable. Counseling is confidential. It is private. Um, go to your GP. If you have that option and you can link in with a mental health practitioner. But the most important thing is to let someone know. If you're in a fortunate position where you do have someone that you can confide in within your family or your friends, that's great. Absolutely do it and let them know how you're feeling. But if you don't feel like that's an option to you, link in with your GP, link in with your mental health practitioner, reach out. There's aware, there's, you know, and in and, and, and Derry, for example, there's Men's Action Network. Um, there's so many other different organizations that you can reach out to with trained counselors. And you have to remember, it's completely confidential. I'll get guys coming through to me and they'll say, Samantha, are people going to find out that I'm coming here? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. It's confidential, but it's so necessary that you deal with those feelings and emotions before it gets to a crisis point. Because if you're starting to think that there's a problem, then there probably is. Yeah, 100%. So finally, where can people find out more about you, Samantha? You know, if they're dealing with mental health or if they just want to find out more, a little bit more about what you do or how can they contact you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know that I, I, I find you on LinkedIn, so you can have a look there as well. Um, and at the minute, I'm currently in the process of getting my website up and running. So it's www.haikucoach.com. Um, that might be down in the next day or two because I know there's a bit of work going on behind the scenes. Or you can email me at the coach at outlook.com as well. Um, my contact details are also on the website if you feel like reaching out. And please do reach out. That is one thing I would say. People would say, oh, you know, Samantha, I saw you on chatting or whatever, but I didn't feel like I could reach out. No, reach out. Absolutely. If you need help or if you, if you even just need questions answered, you know, um, yeah, coach in business and talk about that. But from a mental health perspective, as well i'm a human being if you've got questions you need me to help you find support or help reach out i'm more than more than happy to do that i love that from a human being perspective or you know from that perspective you're a human being awesome samantha thank you thank you very much chris thank you for having me it's 